Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you're doing well. It's uh, another lovely day here, of course, in the UK. I hope the same applies for elsewhere. I'm Matthew Secker, Conference Manager for Read Midem, based in London, and um, I'm very happy to introduce this session this afternoon. Purple launched the day talks last month as a new format of free webinars, giving the mic to tech and innovation experts in real estate and the built environment. Just a quick reminder about the format. Every day at 3 p.m. UK time or 4 p.m. Paris time, one or several speakers are presenting a topic for 20 minutes followed by a 10 minute Q&A, when you have the platform to interact with our expert speakers. And in order to do it, it's at the bottom of the screen. Just click onto the Q&A button. Today, we're delighted to have Lucette Demetz, Dominic Collins, Alice Britton, and Piers Mulrooney. Hello, everyone. How are you? Good, thank you very much. Nice to be here. Good, thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how can immersive tech transform the real estate industry. Um, so yeah, without further ado, over to you. Take it, take it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Matthew already said, welcome to today's webinar on the role of immersive tech in transforming the real estate industry. My name is Lucette de Metz. I'm the Head of Urban Innovation for London and Partners. For those of you who don't know us, we are London's International Trade, Investment and Promotion Agency. It's my pleasure to be your chair for today's panel discussions. Before we start, uh, I just wanted to share two quick introduction slides. Uh, if Guillaume could uh, kindly share the screen. Perfect. Um, so we can move on to the next slide, please. So hopefully you can all see that. Uh, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with the world of immersive technologies. Um, but as I only recently started to immerse myself in that, uh, excuse the pun, I thought it was useful to just have a quick few definitions on the screen for those of you who are new to it. Uh, although our panelists will no doubt do it more justice in explaining the actual practicalities of it. Um, but they are essentially technologies that extend the reality or create a new reality, basically surrounding the user and enveloping them into a different world, whether that be a completely virtual world, and some of you may have experienced that through using headsets, in museums and other uh, places, or whether it's augmented reality, which effectively enhances uh, reality by adding a virtual experience often through the use of a smartphone. Um, so for those of you who play Pokemon Go, that would be a good example of that. Uh, a mixed reality, as it suggests, a combination of the two, really. Uh, haptics makes it more interactive and brings more of the physical aspects into that. So that's just a quick um, snapshot of what we're talking about. So if you hear about AR, VR, and MR, uh, that's what we mean. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, just a, a few key facts before we kick off as to the reason why we chose immersive technologies as the topic for discussion today. As you can see here, uh, there is a massive expected market for immersive technologies across the piece, expected to reach around $160 billion in the next three years. And even though real estate may only take a, a part of that, uh, we weren't able to find a more recent figure than the Goldman Sachs study from 2016. However, that in fact only covers part of the globe um, and so may well be out of date and probably already more sizable. But needless to say is that AR, VR, MR will start to play an increasing role in the real estate sector as well. And even though the sector has often been criticized as being quite slow to adopt innovation uh, in comparison with some other industries, I think we can all agree that the tide is changing rapidly. Uh, and in fact, the situation we currently find ourselves in may well lead to an acceleration of that uh, journey. So I'm delighted to be joined today by three amazing experts who are leading the way in the adoption of immersive tech in real estate will be sharing their views on how the industry is changing. So we will have uh, Dominic Collins from Darabase. Uh, Darabase have developed a, a dedicated database to help manage the growing opportunity for the use of AR physical assets, which will basically help property owners to manage permissions, maximize their assets and de-risk the market. 
We will also have View City, represented by Piers Mulroney. Uh, View City have developed an amazing 3D model and platform covering the whole of London to an accuracy level of 15 centimeters, which is pretty impressive, uh, and I have seen it myself. And they are leading the way in integrating data and immersive tech to facilitate planning and demonstrate the impact of buildings on surrounding environments, even before they are built. And last but not least, we have Alice Britton from Squint Opera, a creative digital studio and consultancy, helping to make better places through the use of immersive experiences, whether that's through use for better tools for better public engagement, or indeed bringing together all the key actors from architects and designers to planners in the early stages of uh, creating those places. So that's all for my introduction today. Uh, the aim of today is to have a conversation, to shine a spotlight on what some of the possibilities is, are for immersive tech. Uh, it will only provide you with a glimpse, but do please not hesitate to follow up further with myself or any of our panelists uh, if you wish to hear more or indeed see some actual demonstrations uh, in the future. So Piers, I'm going to kick off today's conversation uh, by coming to you um, to get your views on the real estate industry, which is, as I mentioned before, typically seen as fairly traditional and perhaps not as quick to adopt innovation. I'm just wondering what changes you have seen in, in the past few years and what you may think the impact of the current pandemic could be on this. Cheers. Thanks, Lisa. I think for me, the most interesting thing to acknowledge, uh, so my background was starting with then lease, um, moving across to countryside, the house builder. So kind of coming from those real core worlds of development um, and planning. And the biggest thing I found most interesting is actually since 2015, there's been a massive investment in prop tech. So you're looking at over 75 billion that's been invested globally in prop tech in just the past five years. Um, this is all chasing this idea where um, the importance of something like space as a service. So I think traditionally in real estate, when you were good at real estate, the idea was you could let a supermarket uh, like Tesco take your building for 25 years on a lease, tidy it up and then sell it as an investment. And it was a really good real estate deal and you didn't really have to try that hard. Um, where that's massively changed is the likes of people like WeWork or Appear Here making the consumer the, the, consumer the center of the real estate world. So the idea where um, we really speak by walking. If we go shopping in a shopping center, we're going to experience. So it's really put that consu consumer at the center of it. So the idea of space as a service. Um, a side effect from this is it's given people choice and that then has increased competition. So with increased competition in the real estate world, the larger asset managers, developers, um, and uh, some of the agents of this world have had to be more competitive and adapt and create space that's suitable for people. What you're seeing at the moment with something like COVID is a huge acceleration in this process. So whilst real estate was moving traditionally towards a consumer-led space as a service, we've now seen everyone's perceptions globally of what the built environment means to them. The importance of outdoor space, for example, in the residential sector, and the idea of changing how you think about commuting has shifted everyone's focus entirely on what is the use of a building? What do I need my central London office for? And I think the real estate world has to adapt as a whole. And I think the challenge for prop tech and immersive tech is how much we can be used in this crisis period, but also going forward to effectively ensure that real estate stays a consumer led sector. Um, and kind of that's the logic of something like View City is um, historically it was about knowledge and understanding what you knew as a professional to get your scheme through planning. That has now massively changed. and. For us, it's the idea of build a digital twin, let everyone test their ideas in a transparent, open gaming world that everyone has access to, be it the general public or a private developer. You know, give Landsec the same amount of power as um, Joe Bloggs in, in Bromley. And the idea is, is if we put everyone on the same element of transparency and data access, can we make better decisions for our cities that make them better places to live going forward? Um, that's, that's kind of my initial take of what, what what I've seen in the past few years, and I think what Corona is going to hopefully drive into the sector is this consumer-led focus. Thanks. Yes, um, very insightful uh, and useful to hear from somebody who comes at it from an originally different background. Um, Alice, uh, would you like to have in your perspectives, perhaps coming from a very different perspective? Um... Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, we're certainly seeing um, a lot of innovation across the industry. So we work um, at Squint all along the kind of timeline from communicating very sort of early visions to help win competitions and then through design development, public communications, marketing, um, and then to media design within buildings themselves. Um, so following on from the kind of rise of the immersive experience of recent years, this is now obviously just being catapulted um, by the current pandemic situation um, in lots of different ways. I think primarily there's a, like a really clear need for more remote design and more remote collaboration. So we've actually been developing our own sort of VR software to make review experiences more immersive. The idea being that if all decision makers can experience a space before it's built, um, it essentially drives the project forward better. Um, I mean, our focus has always been very much on how to turn complex ideas into much more emotive experiences through narrative. So if you can now actually imagine yourself in a space, um, that's totally transformative um, for your understanding of it. And similarly, I think within marketing, we're seeing um, developers use much more immersive tech in sales suites, things like responsive projection mapping and 360 degree screens. Um, many of those projects that we're currently working on also are abroad. And so we're relying on these VR tools to communicate the development of that work as well. And then I think sort of even within buildings themselves, there's been such a huge increase in smart infrastructure, like Piers was just saying. I mean, I think it's something like 80% of new constructions have got have integrated smart building technology. And there's a serious amount of sort of significant redundancy that's been built into that as well. Um, plus the rolling out of 5G and it's all these things that are now enabling much more immersive media experiences within buildings and public space. So I think certainly the pandemic has really accelerated the digital transformation that's been happening. And I think a reaction coming out of this is that people are going to want more shared experiences. I think there's going to be um, an increased demand for uh, this idea of community and connectivity um, between the physical and the digital, especially if we continue to work remotely more often, which I think we all will, um, and travel less, which, is, um, which will be a good thing. I think our new normal is going to continue to rely on, on technologies to bring people together um, and hopefully with a very much more sort of seamless integration between the real and the virtual. Thank you, Alice. Uh, super insightful. Uh, and I think very much building on what Piers already says about the human aspect of, uh, of the immersive and the technology, uh, which sounds contradictory, but uh, isn't. Um, Dominic, uh, let me come to you. Uh, you come from a very different perspective again, uh, doing quite different things with immersive tech. What's your view on this? Yeah, I think that the main thing is that the shape of the revenue and the business of property owners, managers, developers <clears throat> is going to be very different in this kind of post-COVID world. Um, and I think that companies that will win will see the assets that they ha assets that they have and will start to think about how they can leverage those assets in different ways, leveraging mm -hmm. digital technology. Because I think, as, as both Alice and Piers have said, you know, that if you, if you could argue there was a winner out of this pandemic, it's it's digital adoption and digital transformation. Uh, and so we're going to see an acceleration of how you know the consumers that Piers talked about are, are using technology, um, mm -hmm. and smart property companies are, are going to understand that and are going to kind of double down in the way that they they um, leverage the buildings and the assets that they have. So, for example, if you think about Landsec, which has already been mentioned, you know a major asset that they have is Piccadilly Lights and Piccadilly Circus, mm -hmm. which is the media placement. Um, it's gone from being, you know, a relatively static um, billboard, essentially, to a obviously digital billboard, but also now much more of a media placement. You know, they're, they're putting content on there, they're putting sports on there and so on. Um, and um, certainly from a Dara based perspective, you know, we work with large property companies to uh, enable them to control and potentially monetize how digital content, how augmented reality content appears on their buildings. And there are many very kind of large, iconic, urban, um, buildings and also those that are smaller as well, um, where there's a huge opportunity for them to really start to think about how they can create new value, new revenue streams. Um, so, for example, we've mentioned Appear Here already. Uh, Darabase is the um, AR partner globally for Appear Here. And there's a, a, a clear kind of correlation between immersive and pop up retail, as an example. And so I think we'll just see more companies thinking actually it's way more cost effective. There's low capital investment. You know, I can stand up and test and learn. Uh, new new, exper new experiences and new retail formats and so on, um, as well as thinking about the, the footfall that they have and how they can leverage that footfall to create more more um, value for either their tenants 
for their retail um, partners or actually for their company, you know, for the company themselves. So, um, so yeah, so I think it's going to, the companies that win will be the ones that um, take a few small risks, learn, leverage things like the 5G penetration that we're seeing in urban environments um, and start to, start to look for, for new ways of, of making money from their physical assets. Yeah, it makes uh, complete sense and looking good then for the growth of uh, Darrow Banks, no doubt, uh, as we will start to maximize our assets more. Um, yeah, I hope so. A little bit about the, uh, <laughs> the scale of potential growth and the figures are pretty astronomical if you read some of the, the predictions. Of course, they're not solely within the real estate, but the art of the possible is, is, is quite amazing. Um, however, there are still some, some barriers and challenges around the more large scale adoption of, of these technologies. And I was just wondering, Alex, if I might come to you first as to what that might be uh, in your opinion, or indeed how am I overcome it? Um, yeah, so I think, um, I mean, I think obviously AR and VR are incredibly sort of um, incredibly exciting um, platforms for the future. I think there are, you know, a few challenges and barriers at the moment in particular um, to their sort of larger scale adoption. So um, a few things, I think there's, I think personally, there's just a bit of a sort of general digital fatigue um, at the moment. People are, are, are looking for ways not to spend so much time on their own personal devices. Um, and I think we're going to see that more post the pandemic as well. And um, we've all been doing it it's probably a bit too much in the, in the, in the lockdown. There's also a sort of fear of, um, of the misuse of personal data, um, which I think is a concern when you've, got, when you've got apps that you have to download onto your personal phone. You need to download them, you know, a lot of them. Um, and then with things like this at VR, I think there's a lot of people who simply don't want to wear big, clunky, heavy headsets. Um, and there are also practical issues now um, post the pandemic of, of, of sharing objects amongst people, which I think is just a sort of practical problem. Um, wearing, a lot of people just don't like wearing headsets. They sort of get um, kind of motion sickness. Um, and then there's issues of affordability. They're all, um, you know, even the sort of cheapest headset is sort of 200 pounds. They they're quite expensive and they run on expensive fast machines and everyone has to have them and not everybody does have them. Um, mm -hmm. It's also developing so fast that you have to think about a lot of kind of future proofing that needs to go into the content production of anything that you create. Um, and the visual effects themselves are quite, um, are quite limited in terms of the fact that the technology has got to go quite a long way for processing power. So for us, um, we're sort of really interested in, and, and focused on creating really sort of strong visual material, strong visual impact for our work. We use a lot of animation and lighting and materiality, texture, layers, um, and there are, there are clear limits to what can be achieved um, in VR and AR on that level um, at the moment. Um, so for us, I think it's about making sure that um, content that's available on AR and AR can also be, and VR can also be available on all different um, platforms and any devices at the same time. Right. Thank you, um, Alice. Uh, that's already a very comprehensive answer. Um, Dominic, I'm not sure if you have anything to, to add to that or indeed how we might overcome some of those obstacles, particularly AR maybe yeah. easier. Well, I, think, I think it's interesting. Uh, people um, people think, kind of lump all these things together. It's really useful that you kind of separated them out a little bit at the beginning. People will think of immersive and kind of AR slash VR and immediately go to the headsets and they want to buy these like stupid looking headsets. And, and the, my last company was a company called Jaunt and we were in VR and AR, but very much in the VR, VR world. And that was certainly a, a barrier. But I think that the reality is that the, there's, there are millions, if not billions of people using immersive every day. Um, and the biggest barrier that we have is that the people who potentially make decisions in the property world are not digitally or immersively native. You know, they are not the Snapchat generation. Uh, the average, 75% of Snapchat users, which is about 210 million people per day, um, use AR on average 30 times a day. But they're not thinking, oh, I'm using AR. They're just, the, the Snapchat experience is you open Snapchat and your camera opens and you start layering digital content either on your face or on the world around you. Now that is what we call AR, but it's just the way that they use their phone. And so I think the biggest issue that we have is one of education. It's actually trying to evangelize and educate the, the, you know, all industries, but also the property industry to, for, to help them to understand actually um, how consumer behavior is changing, how digital consumption is changing and how that off offers both risks and also opportunities to their, to their business. 
Thanks, Dominic. I think that's a, a really good point around education. Sometimes the vocabulary kind of, you know, puts people off. Uh, I'm sure that prop tech doesn't necessarily always land well with everybody uh, either. Uh, and Pierce, I'm sure you have some, some views on that, particularly working a lot across the public sector as well. Yeah, on, on what Dominic was saying, very interesting about education and learning. Um, we work quite close with universities in terms of bringing through that next generation. Um, but a big part that we find is that logic of self-conscious and, and stupid. You know, when you're the first one to do something like that, or you put the headset on and everyone else is watching you, you really are alone. Um, but what we're finding actually is we're developing stuff in terms of the multiplayer world. So can we put an entire planning committee into a virtual environment at the same time? And the idea of if we put everyone in at the same time, you remove that barrier of stupidity because you're all looking at each other in the virtual space. Um, in the immersive technology and the idea of getting everyone to do it together in some form of multiplayer or, or you know, the gaming world is leading in, in terms of this technology and the idea of, you know, with augmented reality, with Pokemon Go and things like that, if you make it socially acceptable, we'll find much more mass adoption. Um, related then again to the real estate, it, it seems like, you know, the public was expecting it, you know, we wouldn't go on to Zoopla or right move now and not expect to see a photograph of a house we were looking at. And the same with kind of digital design with planning. A lot of the boroughs in, in forced 3D modeling is part of a requirement for a major application now. And there's no reason the general public shouldn't say, I want to see what this looks like in immersive human scale prior to, you know, going in person to see the house or prior to, mm -hmm. you know, being involved in the planning consultation. So I think we'll start to see that consumer drive driven from, you know, the accessibility piece of gaming. You know, we all have or majority of people have access to a smartphone with the technology built into it already. So I think access to the technology isn't really a problem. It's, it's just getting that social acceptance into mm -hmm. various aspects of people's lives. And then I think, like, like we were saying, the real estate and property world will catch up to it. Yeah, absolutely. I think those are very good points. Often technology isn't the biggest obstacle to overcome in, in many of these areas, not just in immersive, but it's around how people adopt uh, this. Um, I'm mindful of the time. I'm just going to remind our audience that if you do have any questions you would like to ask any of our panelists, uh, please do put them in the Q&A box. Uh, I'm going to come to them in a moment. I just want to ask one final quick question of our panelists. I'm going to say, give me a 30 second answer, literally. Um, one aspect, one example of immersive tech application that you find has been truly transformational whether in your own company or indeed in the wider uh, application. Um, Dominic, I'm going to come to you first for your 30 seconds. Okay, so um, we recently developed a product which hopes to overcome some of the stuff we've spoken about, which is come, um, a product called Monitor with AR at the end. Um, and what Monitor does is it allows a property owner to visualize what AR and digital content is actually on and around their, around their property. There's about 3,000 AR apps in the App Store now, um, many of them world facing. Uh, you've got a lot of graffiti apps, you've got a lot of game apps, placing persistent content on and around buildings. And so Monitor gives um, a simple tool to be able to understand what, what is going on around your property. It also overlays um, mobile uh, network data to actually understand the volume of people around your property, which we think is going to be very interesting from a COVID perspective to understand actually how much, how much unwanted traffic are these, these applications driving to your property. Um, and then also allows you to take action against um, against that content where where it may be libelous or, or, or unwanted uh, directly with the publishers to have that removed. Thanks, Dominic. Pierce, your floor is yours. No worries. Treat it quick. So for me, it's the, us working with TfL and the London boroughs on their planning and development projects. We basically create it in an immersive virtual reality so people can get down to a human scale and understand the project. Um, for TfL and the boroughs, that's kind of transformation in the way they tell stories. And if we can change how you still, talk, still tell stories about development and planning projects, we will build that transparency and trust and bring it back into the sector. So I think that's the most important thing we're working on. Thanks, Piers. And Alice? Um, yeah, so I'm, I think um, our most transform, transformational piece is actually something that we did for um, a visitor attraction. So for the Empire State Building last year, um, where we designed sort of over 40 immersive installations across kind of eight galleries, effectively kind of transforming what was a very long, um, slow queue for, for the lift to get up to the top into something really extraordinary um, and a sort of immersive storytelling um, experience. Um, and in order to do this, we actually, we used our own um, VR software 
um, which is called Space Form, which helped to visualize um, all the sort of media and content within those spaces um, so that all the design teams um, and the clients could get in the space as a sort of collaborative tool. So you can all be in there multi-user at the same time um, and see how that space is going to be transformed and see what that visitor is going to experience before, um, before they go there, which I think is quite, um, quite interesting now as well, because we're also just sort of talking to museums and visitor attractions at the moment about how we can create things like that for those visitors who can't go to those buildings um, at the moment and, um, and for, the, for the sort of near future, if um, social distancing um, continues for a while, I think for, for institutions like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, virtual visits have never been more important than at the present time. Um, so well chosen. Um, I'm going to pick up on a couple of questions that have come in uh, meanwhile. Uh, first one's for Piers uh, from Ray Harley. Uh, very interested to hear how you city managers to update city models on a regular basis given the rapid change of the built environment. So just in response to that, I mean, rapid change is, is a bold statement. It still takes about a year to get a building through planning. So we've got plenty of time to uh, get buildings into View City. Um, we have an active consents team that do a great job modeling consents as they come through. So as a scheme is consented, we get that modeled. And then mm -hmm. every four to five years, we refly using photogrammetry, the cities that we are active in. So we're active in about 13 cities in the UK and Ireland. And then we remodel all the city every five years. But in the interim, we do use that consents timeline so it's just about staying on top of um, what's being given permission. Thank you, Piers. A uh, question from Tom Benson at Sensible City in Boston uh, for Alice. Um, you touched upon this, but how do you see the future of VR in terms of social interaction? Currently, two challenges VR has are the headset and how it's a personal experience. Um, yeah, really good, really good question. And that's sort of, I think, one of the issues that um, that, that I sort of I have with VR is that I think it needs to be much more um, it needs to be much more um, a social experience. I think we need to really be headed towards um, multi-user um, stuff. I mean, I think we've got a lot to learn from um, the gaming industries. I think they've got you know they've got it. They're, they're sort of you know really pushing ahead with this um, with this kind of technology. And I think that's that's definitely where we're headed. I don't think these sort of big clunky headsets for VR are going to be. Um, are going to be around for, for, for too much longer. I think we're in a sort of um, holding pattern with those. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, that's going to be important. Thanks. And I agree with the, the social aspect of it as well. Um, how do you make it a joint experience? Um, a question from Anya Sayaki, uh, which I think is for everyone, from your point of view, how will landlords have to deal with obsolescence of buildings in which they cannot have prop tech? Uh, no future at present for this at present for this type of asset. Um, here is perhaps that one for you. On that one, I'd always argue there's no such thing as an obsolescent building, just mm -hmm. a, a landowner or a landlord that needs advice or guidance. If you look in the property profession globally you know there's really good innovative um ideas for what you can do with space there's a really good rise of you know the temporary meanwhile space so if you look at as ongoing development schemes like um you know the ideas of things like brixton pop when they first started the collective did that which was containers you know using containers to create cool retail space i think it's just about putting those ideas together london is a great place for that but globally the community of real estate professionals is getting a lot better at communicating and sharing their ideas you know via Instagram or, or LinkedIn mm -hmm. and the idea of that shared knowledge means that no building or place should be obsolescent you should be able to constantly reinvent real estate space I don't uh, you know even you know if you look at community-led pubs in villages where they've turned them into museums slash cultural icons every building has a has a use and a place and it's about putting the right passionate real estate professional in a room with the right technology and prop tech to mm -hmm. highlight um, that building well, that, couldn't agree more. Uh, another question on technology, which I might come to Dominic for. Um, how do you future-proof your current VR or AR technology given the change? Fair amount of work goes into developing the technology. How do you mitigate the risk of it becoming redundant? The yeah, good, good, <laughs> good question. Um, so I think, um, I suppose it's about trying to back horses that are likely to still be winning in the future. And what I mean by that is, for example, 
Um, if you build in Unity, for example, you know, Unity has a thing called AR Foundation, which sits on both uh, AR Kit and AR Core. Unity themselves are investing a huge amount into um, immersive platforms and allows you to kind of, to a degree, it's slightly simplistic, but build once and allow you to kind of publish many times to different, different platforms. So try wherever you can to, to use a, you know, a relatively agnostic technology, such as something like, like Unity, which allows you then to publish to many different devices. I mean, that, we had a, an example recently where we did a lot of work with a company called Scape, um, a London-based um, AR cloud company, which many of you will, um, will have heard of. Um, and it was an amazing company. They were doing some great work. It was a really excellent partnership between ourselves and Scape, and then Facebook went and bought them. Uh, and turned off the SDK. So that you know, that in, in a fast-moving um, industry like this, you're always going to have some level of risk. But if you can try and compartmentalise the way that you build your experiences as much as you can, in order that you could swap out to a degree, you know, another computer vision um, partner, in the knowledge that maybe those things do have to be a little bit more flexible, um, mm -hmm. then hopefully you can future-proof your uh, your outputs. Great. Any other final comments from Pierce or Alice on that particular question? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I could just add to that by sort of saying not, not from a sort of technology point of view, but also more from a sort of content point of view is sort of making you know, so much of, of the work, at least that we do, is about the sort of creative vision behind what the content actually is, what it, what it might look like. Um, and how it's understood and what that narrative is that underpins what you're trying to communicate. Um, and that sort of thing will never, you know, that can be transferred onto, onto any different platform and any different sort of software. So I think um, there's also sort of other levels to what future proofing um, can actually mean within, um, within these, these technologies. Uh, I think we have room for one final question, uh, also for Alice, um, from Nilesh Patel. Um, I've worked with an office that commissioned Squint Opera. I'm interested in the development of narrative and how spaces might be photographed stroke experienced. VR technology seems to try to replicate reality. Is there a role or place for more abstract representation? I think there's always a role for um, abstract representation. Um, I think there's always a role for um, for finding new ways new ways to look at things, whether that's um, abstract representation or sort of graphic representation of things, um, or indeed um, photographing and and filming in in VR is also in a way an abstract representation of a space because you're not. Um, you can you can suddenly sort of see and hear things that are happening behind. I mean, you you know, it's a, it's a distortion of, of of reality. Any kind of depiction, I suppose, of 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 a space is is a distortion to a certain extent. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, I think there's there's always there's always a role for for more abstract representation in everything we do. I mean, so, some of the most powerful VR experiences I've ever seen have been animation and illustrative, rather than trying to you know, even though my last company did film and capture cinematically actually because you're able to build a, a virtual world in a way that animators already have done or you know always have done actually i think abstract often works much better uh, for, certainly from a storytelling perspective than trying to uh, kind of create a stereoscopic false version of reality yeah absolutely and just the way in which you can manipulate space as well so you can move from one area to another sort of seamlessly is, is you know it, it's magic and it needs to be um you know, it needs to be considered on that on that level and, and, and used like that, definitely. Thanks, Dominic, Alice. Um, I'm afraid we've kind of run out of time. Uh, I know we've only managed to probably touch the surface of uh, all what immersive tech can bring to the real estate industry. Um, before I hand back over to Matthew to close off today, I want to thank our speakers for their insights, contributions and their time. Uh, I'd like to thank Propel by MIPIM for organizing another great session today. And of course, the audience for uh, staying with us and for sharing your questions. Um, I'm sure all of the speakers, I uh, hope I don't speak on their behalf too much, uh, will be happy to demonstrate some of their applications uh, in a more visual way, which we weren't able to do in the course of today. Um, but hopefully this has sparked all your interest uh, and uh, further opportunities. Um, so thank you for me and I'll hand back over to Matthew. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, very, very interesting session. Um, I don't have anything personally further to add. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day and hope you can join us for our next uh, daily talk tomorrow at the same time. Uh, for that, we'll be joined by Spacemaker and OBOS, who will speak on how to collaborate to make the digital transformation a success. Hope you can make it. Um, take care, everyone, and see you again soon.
Thank you very much.